I'd like to call to order the meeting of the Valacitas Water District for <coughs> January 19th. <laughs> and I'd like to ask Director Ellie Tharp to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. My pleasure. Ready to begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And um, roll call, please. Director Alpha? Here. Director Hernandez? Here. Director Martin? Here. Director Snell? Here. Director Evans? Yes. Okay, and um, the first item of business is to adopt agenda for the regular meeting of January 19th. Do I have a motion? Yes. Madam Chairperson, uh, due to the amount of response we have on item 2.4, I'd like to move 2.4 uh, up as our first action item. I'm sorry. I would you repeat that again? Due to the response that we have on one of our items 2.4, I'd like to see that we move 2.4 up to the head of our action items. All right. Yeah. That requires a second. I'll second it. Okay. Then move to second it that we move item 2.4 to the first item on the action items. Those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. Thank you. It passed and we'll do so. Okay. Now we. Um, First thing, we have an introduction of a new employee today um, by uh, Bridget Anderson. Hello. Thank you very much for hearing us. I know you guys have a long night ahead. Um, I'd like to introduce Jessica Ruiz. She started at the district on November 3rd in the part-time position of cashier receptionist. But we liked her so much, on the 19th of December, she joined us full-time. Uh, she comes to us from U.S. Bank, where she worked for three years, and in her free time, she enjoys crafting, cooking, and hiking. Oh, welcome. Oh, welcome. Thank you. You <laughs> are going to stay now, are you? Because you're committed. <laughs> okay. Or you should be. I've seen you out there. You're doing a good job. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. I don't believe we have any, anyone in the audience at this time who'd like to speak. So we will move on to um, consent calendar. Um, all matters listed under the consent calendar will be voted upon by one motion. There will be no separate discussion of these items unless the board member or member of the public requests that a particular item be removed from the consent calendar in which case it will be considered separately under action item. Um, do I have a motion? I'll move to approve the consent calendar. Second. Thank you. We have a motion and a second to approve the consent calendar. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. It carried unanimously. Okay. That will make the first item on the agenda action item will be item 2.4, which is a Discussion on the capital facility fees. We do have some speakers. I'm assuming they would like to speak after the presentation, <coughs> normally. That's probably a good way to do it. Okay. Um, and we'll have, a, this was put on the agenda at the request of Mike Sanella, and um, I believe we're going to have a, re a presentation by staff. Would you like to start out? Yeah, and I appreciate uh, getting this on the agenda so soon and, and all the work that's gone into it by staff. Um, my, my thought process when I brought this up initially was to get um, an overview on the ordinance, especially as it pertains to 177, which is the sewer justification fees. Um, kind of get some background on that. We do have a relatively new board, um, and there's, there has been some mention on a couple of two or three different occasions that there's some confusion around the issue. So. I thought it'd be a good time at the start of the new year to uh, to get a formal staff presentation and also invite the public uh, who um, may have concerns or, or different differences of opinion uh, on the matter to give them an opportunity to uh, to speak as well. And 
Um, with that, I'll turn it over. I'm also hoping, and I don't know how this, this works in this kind of format, but I would really prefer to have kind of more of an open dialogue, some questions and answers versus just presentation, presentation, and then speakers. And I, I really want this to be a discussion and hopefully be more productive that way. Yeah. Madam President. Yes. That's a great idea, Mike. However, I don't think we want to get into a debate of, and having, <laughs> this is embarrassing, ladies and gentlemen, being a senior board member. Like I've been here one day longer than someone. Um, but I don't want to get into a debate about who believes what is real and what isn't real uh, because uh, this is, I spent $600 on the, uh, the seminar. Uh, what color is this tablet, Michael? No, it's yellow. Well, the fact of it is, is we've seen the different side of the same topic, and I, and if as long as we don't get this into it, an I, I agree. I don't, I don't yeah. want to debate. Oh, good. All right. But if there are some questions and follow-up questions, so forth. Oh, even more. Great. Well, I think then if if the board confers, we'll start with the presentation. At at the end of the presentation, if we have specific questions, and then we can um, ask our. Um, speakers to come up and speak and then if we fall into further discussion as long as it's not a debate um, i think that's okay would you like to start i don't know who's yeah I'll, I'll just kind of give a little background here uh, not knowing exactly what directors uh, director snella's um, questions or what it would be on this presentation it's kind of hard to present a, a, a come up with something to explain it uh, so what you did have in the board pack, it's a very simple presentation, which is the ordinance, the policy, um, and the background, which is in the fee structure, which is required to be completed uh, by the district and adopted to adopt any fees. Uh, so we did go through that. Uh, James uh, does have a presentation that he's made to the board several times uh, that we did have loaded that we can present, and it's basically history of how we got here. It'll show you the meetings we've had, why we had it, how long it's been in discussion, and the process behind it. We don't get into the nuts and bolts of the study. Study speaks for itself, uh, as far as uh, from staff standpoint. Uh, but just to go back a little bit in time and history to explain why this came about, um, it was first looked at by the board. I want to say probably seven, eight years ago, uh, when the uh, obviously a different board. And one of the items that the board had us take care of at staff level to bring to them as one of their goals uh, as a board was how do we handle the multitude of projects that are coming in with densities far greater than what was allowed in the master plan. And the reason this came about was we started to do a lot of the water analysis studies that are required by AB 221 and I can't remember the other number, uh, where whenever a project comes in over a certain number of units or a certain square footage, the, the board has to do a study identifying where the water will come from for the next, I want to say it's 20 years, and the projection of that growth. How are we gonna get it? Where does it come from? Who's gonna provide the water? Um, back then we had probably six or seven, maybe eight very large projects coming. So we actually did, I wanna say four or five of those studies. The trick is the studies are not cumulative. So if we do a study and we say, yeah, we'll have water or facilities available for it, it's a standalone study for that project. It's not cumulative. So the next time we do another study, it's a standalone study, it's a snapshot in time. The board had concerns that we were going down a path of a number of very large projects that were greatly going to increase uh, demand, both water and sewer generation. So what they asked us to come up with was a policy uh, for the board to consider for mitigating this impact. And the reason they wanted to look at mitigation uh, for these is whenever a project comes in, we do have an obligation as a responsible party to comment on EIRs for these projects. It's our duty and our responsibility to make sure that any impact is mitigated. Uh, when it first came through, there was a mitigation considered for, I mean, uh, considered for water, for storage, uh, the land outfall, treatment, and the ocean outfall at Encina. There were four parts. Uh, we went through that, um, good shot at the first time. We had some problems with it. The uh, board rescinded it and said, okay, go back and look at it again when the new master plan gets done. When we came back after the second master plan was done, going through the whole process, and I'll have James get up and walk you through that to show you how many meetings and how many times we met and discussed this. What came out of it was strictly a treatment component. The other issues of mitigation of extra storage, extra pipe capacity, extra land outfall, the ocean outfall, they were all mitigated by the payment of additional fees. So if you paid an extra house, 
the extra water permit you paid, you paid for the additional storage because that was built into the fee, it was adequate. The component that was not adequate was the tr wastewater treatment. So when we first started going through it, the issue is, okay, well, the developer can build treatment capacity, which is pretty hard to go build 1,000 gallons or 10,000 gallons or 100,000 gallons. We can buy capacity from one of the other partners at Encina if they choose to sell it to us, if there's extra capacity that they don't need. Uh, the nice part about that is Encina is governed by what they call the RBA. The board just adopted that, I think, two board meetings ago, the revised basic agreement at Encina. The good part is it establishes a fixed cost for that capacity so that one of the, one of the member agencies can't really hold another agency hostage by saying, yeah, we'll sell it to you, but we're going to sell it to you at three times the market value. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't allow that. Um, and then the third option was to come up with an impact fee, that that would be the way that they mitigated their impact. They would pay the district, and the district would hold the funds, and when we needed the additional treatment capacity, the, tra the risk was transferred from the developer or future homeowner to the district. We then had the responsibility to build that capacity when we needed, when we needed it. Uh, that seemed to be the direction the board wanted to go, and that's what was pursued. Keep in mind, if we decided we need to expand a treatment plant, give me 10 to 15 years to do it, minimum 10 years. That's how long it takes. So it's a long process to get there. Um, so we went through that with the next master plan, and again, I'll have James get up and uh, walk you through the presentation on how we got there uh, with all the dates and the times, but that was the basis behind this was that we don't need any additional treatment between now and 2030. I believe that was our projected date. If the existing land use gets built, we're good. We don't need any more treatment. Sometime after 2030, we might need some more. Um, the impact has always been a question of capacity versus use. They're two different animals. Uh, capacity means we have the capacity available. Uh, there's been a statement, statements have been made over the past couple of years, five years, uh, how, well, but you have capacity, therefore we should be able to use it. We're not saying you can't use it. We want to let you use it. You just need to mitigate your impact of using capacity more than was allowed for your land use. That was the whole purpose. You can use what's there. We don't care. Uh, that's why we built it. That's why the board looked so far ahead when we built Metal Arc and when we expanded Encina. We wanted to push it out as far as it could. Um, we would then have the funds necessary to expand at some point in the future. Uh, so that's what you have before you. Along that process, we have the master plan, the EIR that certified the master plan, and then the fee study that was done by Atkins, which I provided a copy of you too, that has all the justification and the background in it. Uh, you'll see the meetings that James is going to walk you through. It was quite a laborious process to get there. Um, it has been in effect since those policies have been adopted. And yeah, that's where we stand today. Thank you. James? Uh, thank you. Um, Madam President, members of the board, I got a quick three-hour presentation of engineering. <laughs> this is where engineering and accounting meet. <laughs> so, now, actually, this is, a, this is a, again, as a General Manager Lamb indicated, this is actually a shortened version of a previous presentation. I know that uh, Director Hernandez has probably been seeing all the presentations. And uh, Director Evans and Martin has seen at least one presentation uh, what, right when you guys first took office. So this will be new for uh, two of the directors here. So with that, uh, this is the 2012 uh, Capital Facility Fees presentation. This is an overview. We've uh, The numbers themselves are, are different because they've changed over time. Uh, but the concepts and the methodology is what we're really covering today. So uh, just a little bit of history, just to continue. So back in March of 1999, CDM, Camp Dresser McKee, prepared a capital facility study. It utilized the growth method because we're a growth agency. Uh, it based on the most recent master plan at the time. Uh, it met the requirements of uh, Assembly Bill 1600. So with that, VWD updated a model, uh, which is the rate model, uh, with the most recent costs and growth for the capital improvement project. Back in November 2011, Atkins, which is our consultant that did the 2008 master plan and programmatic EIR, uh, also prepared a capital facility fee study. It also utilized the growth method because our projections from SANDAG and from the city land use show that we're still very much a growth agency, uh, unlike many other agencies in the county and in uh, Los Angeles County. Uh, we based on the most recent master plan, which in this case was 2008, and it met the requirements of AB 1600. Uh, with that, here's kind of a snapshot of what we're looking at here. 
within the master plan, we phased out the construction. And you see we had water, sewer, and the outfalls are land outfall. And you can see the phases is 2010, 2011 to 15 of where that money and how that money was going to be spent to build those capital projects. So it kind of phase in where the district may go out and seek out new debt to cover those costs and also phase in how and when district might need to collect and how much capacity fees it might need to collect. Uh, it tied to, we also tied BWD's and CWA's urban water management plans together, uh, which was in June of 2011. And Atkins completed the study itself back uh, using the 2008 master plan, and we started a public workshop process. Uh, I won't go through every public workshop with you because I think we had 22 of them on this presentation, and I think we're missing at least three or four at least. So, but we started the first one in February of 2010, and it was a board committee workshop, uh, mainly the progress of the master plan. And we then we continue on. The ones that are green were public workshops specifically held for the development community. Uh, we made sure we invited uh, representatives from the development community that were interested, including the, the BIA. And they were in attendance of almost all these, uh, I, I believe they are in attendance for all of these, actually. So you can see we started the first one back in August 18th of 2010, and uh, we called it Workshop 1. Uh, we covered our methodology that we're pursuing for the master plan. Uh, questions about capacity fees were came up during that one. In August 25th of 2010, we had our second workshop, and that's where we outlined the methodologies with them. Uh, we gave theoretical examples and calculations, and of course, the next questions were about the density increases. So in September, we had that next workshop, uh, and obviously you can see what we went over there, including the impact fee study at this time. So, and of course, we gave examples of that. So we continued on October, we had our workshop number four, and uh, that's where we, this is how we would apply the, the fees, basically, was the main workshop of that, and the determination and examples of how that would affect a specific development. Uh, you can see the other public meetings uh, that continued on into 2011 and all the way into 2012, one more page. Uh, and then we had two more workshops in January and February 2012. They're workshops six and seven, basically. Uh, and basically with that, we had historical cap, cap fees, review of it, and then of course, um, the review of the uh, impact fee determination, which was in the February 2012. Uh, maybe one more slide here. Nope, that's it. So the last workshop we have on this was uh, April 18th, 2012. So we continued starting back, just to go back, the process in February 2008, and we continued, and on this had about 22 meetings through April 2008. <coughs> so with that, just a couple differences, and these differences are important for later in the presentation because it made a big impact to most developments. Actually, the new master plan uh, reduced the development fees as far as uh, capacity fees by EDU by almost 20%, and I could explain why as we go through. Uh, so the old master plan and the new master plan followed very similar methodologies, except we had new technology. So with that, we had a GIS-based water model that looked at every single pipe in the district. We were able to actually uh, do a five-year phasing while back in 2002, <coughs> there was two time steps. There was 2020 and there was alternate. So that helped kind of moderate the amount of money that would, that district would need to collect to for capacity fees uh, and kind of time out how the, the, the money would flow a little bit better. Uh, and then, of course, we looked at ultimate build-out for the outfall, which wasn't looked at in the 2002 master plan. Uh, the um, theory there was we only had one chance to build the outfall, so we better look at ultimate. Now, the time steps 2020 and 2030, that comes directly from SANDAG, which gives the population growth. They project out in five-year increments all the way up to the, whatever the next time step is. I believe in the new master plan that we're looking, looking at now, the time step goes out to 2035. And then they have another step that's called ultimate. They don't give you a date on that ultimate. It's just called ultimate, and that's kind of infill of everything that's left. Um, so the master plan, as far as the workshop highlights, uh, we have five years of existing water and sewer records. So we don't guess on the numbers. We actually have all the meter records. And as, a, as the board knows, about 80% of our meters are single family homes, not apartment complexes, not commercial, not industrial, We're very heavy single family homes at this time. And with that, looking at the five years of records and looking at all, at all the previous master plans that also follow the same methodology using actual sewer records and actual water meter records. 
And uh, the board may be aware that we actually have sewer meters. I think we're up to 16 or 18 sewer meters in different areas of our district. So we are able to compare the water meter records and the sewer meter records and kind of calibrate them to make sure they make sense. Uh, basically, an a equivalent dwelling unit for water was about 500 gallons per day. And equivalent dwelling unit for sewer was about 250. But what happened since 2002 was a lot of new growth happened. San Leo Hills, a lot of higher density growth happened. So we looked at that high density and that mixed use factor, and we actually had some examples. No, none that existed previous to 2002 uh, as far as a, a significant amount. But after 2002, we had more development, a little higher densities. And what that essentially did is it reduced that high density factor from 250 to 200. And also for the sewer, it reduced it from 225 to about 180. So it reduced it 20%. So when a developer came in with a high density uh, project, instead of paying a full EDU, they're paying about 20% less because the district doesn't, we prorate it. We don't round up to the nearest EDU. So with that, the cap, cap fees were prorated based on proposed development. And Sandag also showed in the 2008 master plan that we're still a growth agency. We still have 40% growth, especially in the sewer in our, in, within uh, the area. So what is a capital facility fee? Well, uh, basically it's a one-time charge to develop. Okay? It recovers the cost of expanded facilities. And the revenues used are to offset the, the, the construction that's used for those expanded facilities, basically the CIP and the debt that's incurred to build those facilities. So really quick, uh, we use the growth equation. So basically that means the total assets. So those numbers I showed you uh, with all the different categories, basically all those values divided by the number of EDUs. And it's, so it's pretty simple. And basically what <coughs> required steps that we need for it, we needed to adopt a new master plan. We needed to adopt the programmatic environmental impact report with it, which happened in August 2011. And we looked at the uh, pump stations, lift stations, the outfall, obviously, uh, storage, conveyance. We looked at all those facilities that we have to build from now to 2030 within there. Uh, and then, uh, but there's no new wastewater treatment within our 2008 master plan. And let me say that one more time. There was no new wastewater treatment within our 2008 master plan. And I'll show you in tables how that kind of make it relevant with the density impact fee coming up. Uh, the district completed a cap fee study uh, after the master plan was adopted, and that utilized obviously the master plan cost and timing, and then that's where the accounting, the financing came in. The time steps, those five-year increments that you saw in the, probably the second slide, or right after the summary of work, summary of meetings, of where facilities would be built and where the district would go out for debt to uh, borrow to build those facilities, because you can't build part of a pipeline, you can't build part of a treatment plant. Uh, you gotta, if you have to build it, you have to build it for capacity, take on the debt, and collect fees and repay yourself later. So, so here is uh, my attempt at a very simple capacity fee illustration. So the numbers really don't matter, they go out for 30 years, and about every five years you see a little, uh, you see a little jump in the number or a dip in the number. That's a new cycle a new master plan cycle in which we know that we're on target or we're off target, and we try to moderate that. So in a given year, though, we may, this is what we may collect, okay? And, uh, and so, for example, some years we over collect, and some years we under collect. So when we under collect, uh, where does the money come from? Well, it comes from our reserves. So. That's where it comes from. And when we over collect, ideally we pay back our reserves. With the end goal, since as the board knows, we're a nonprofit entity, to basically net zero at the end of the day. Every facility that we built was paid for accordingly, and there's no extra money that was collected by the district. That's the end goal. And that's why this is done at a periodic rate to make sure we're not too far off target. Because if we are off target, for example, and we under collect, the next round of Nexus studies for AB 1600 would show a dramatic increase for us to catch up. And that's what we're trying not to do. We're trying not to, we're trying to make sure that we collect the proper amount at the proper rate to ensure that the future developments are not hindered by the burden of previous developments. So with that, 
Let's talk about capacity versus average use. Now, this is a term that we talk with all the time. People come into our office and talk about use, okay? Uh, capacity, first off, is the peak plus other industrial standards or regulatory requirements. We're talking fire flow, storage requirements, peak wet weather. A perfect example, I think I used the example at the uh, first uh, workshop that I did with Director Martin Evans is, is uh, streets. San Marcos Boulevard, obviously, if it had a level of service A, it could handle all the cars during that rush hour, free flow, no backup. But obviously it doesn't, it has a level of service, I don't know, C or D probably at best, and so it backs up during rush hour. Well, in our industry, we can't afford to do that. I mean, could you imagine people get up in the morning, they try to take a shower and just drips out because there's no flow. Or you flush the toilet in the morning and there's an overflow in the street every morning. Obviously, our level of service has to be A. So we're built for peak and that's capacity. Use is use. Uh, so we, and we do utilize use. Use is still an important number for us. It's utilized uh, for planning, it's utilized for billing, it's utilized in our urban water management plan, but we cannot size the infrastructure. Uh, another example that actually a friend of mine gave to me is, you know, if you look at the average household use, and, and that goes to sewer, you know, 250 gallons a day, let's say, that equates to, and I'm going off memory, about 30% of one ounce every second. Okay, 0.33 of an ounce every second. That means your toilet would only need a, a line that's a quarter inch. Okay, obviously that's not gonna work. So your house is not built for use. We don't plan for or, or average use. We don't plan for average use and it's capacity. So systems, when people come talk to us, they still need full capacity connections. Even with the smart growth that we're seeing, they still want full capacity connections. Full capacity sewer connection, full capacity water connection. That means that infrastructure in the street that's being built and paid for has to be full size. The San Marcos Interceptor has to be full size. And on the treatment side of the house, the amount of solids going down the line, that hasn't changed. Because as the board's aware, we're charged by strength of sewer. So less water doesn't mean less solids. So with that, uh, let's talk about the wastewater fee itself. And, and I know we want to get into the density impact fee, but you have to have a base understanding of the wastewater fee because they, they interrelate. Uh, there's three components of our wastewater capacity fee. Treatment, conveyance, and land outfall. Now, land outfall is unique. Uh, there's very few agencies that have a land outfall component, and that's because we, we are in need of a parallel land outfall. Uh, conveyance is a pretty normal one. That's all. That's the San Marcos Interceptor. That's Linda Vista pipe. You know, a lot of stuff that's in construction now that the board's already aware of. Uh, and then treatment here, as you can see, there's no dollars in treatment within our master plan or within our cap fee study. So out to 2030, we're whole on treatment. However, there's debt, uh, and that's Metal Arc expansion and Encina Phase Five expansion specifically. That's the debt that the district incurred on those two projects. So with that, where do we sit in the area? Well, you know, again, these numbers aren't exact because they were adjusted prior to ad adoption. But as you can see, if you, if you average things out and you take away the parallel land outfall, which is fairly unique to Valencia's Water District, we're about in the middle here. And you can see the other numbers is where we were and what, we're, what we were proposing to adopt. But what we're trying to avoid is being up here, the big spikes that some of these agencies had from year to year was because of under collection of capacity <laughs> fees for several periods before that. Uh, with that, what are the effects of density increase in the district? Well, there's, there's several really, uh, and mainly has to do with treatment, but it affects us on all. It's water and sewer within all realms. Uh, the capacity fees are calculated based on the densities of adopted land uses. So the cities give us their adopted land use. Sandag gives us the population growth. And so the district itself just takes the information by the other responsible agencies. Uh, the premise of the cap fee is that all development shall mitigate its own impact to basically pay its way. And when the land use is changed, that resu results in new calculation. Basically, we didn't account for it. Is, is a simple way to say it. We, didn't, we accounted for 100 units and there's 200. We didn't account for this extra 100 units. And so how do we handle this? So in our case, you know, we only look at the component, that extra 100 units, and what impact are they having to us? 
So as a whole, and we're looking at water and sewer. And within sewer, we're looking at all those components that I showed you earlier. And water actually has two components themselves. It's storage and conveyance also. Oops. So the density impact fee on wastewater. So you're looking at the 2008 master plan for adopted general land use. And we started that. The cutoff date was June 30th, 2008. People always ask me why that date. Well, you have to have a cutoff date. That's the foundation of the master plan. And you build from there. And it takes almost two years to get to the end result, especially with the environmental process. The environmental impact report, we can do a master plan fairly quickly, but it's going to take almost a year to do an EIR. So um, if you change the land use, you start over. And then you have another two years. So no matter what, it's about a two-year process total. Uh, future development would increase densities above the land use, cause a greater impact to wastewater treatment, is what we discovered. Uh, the wastewater density impact fee is on the increased density portion only, and we want to do an equitable recovery of the cost of expansion of Encina. And then, you know, we have normal fees that we collect from them also, but they affect, uh, and as General Manager Lamb indicated, it makes sense. An extra house or storage required means extra storage on the water extra conveyance on the sewer, extra treatment in sewer. And again, we do, not, we do not have a treatment component in our current fee structure. So calculating the fee, all development will pay the wastewater capital fees for treatment, conveyance, and land outfall. So we collect from everybody. So that example, that whole 200 we collect from, the 100 that we thought we were going to get, the extra 100, well, they're impacting the conveyance, they're in fact impacting the land outfall makes sense. The extra units are using more water, they're flushing, they're impacting all those things. Development which increases density beyond those identified in the master plan will pay the density impact fee. Now that fee is specific because there is no treatment component. And now we have a treatment issue. And density increases will be clearly identified in the water wastewater study. So when we do a, every development that comes through the door, we do a, what we call a water wastewater study. And within the water wastewater study, we say these 100 <coughs> units that we expect, we pay the normal fee. These other 100 units that we didn't expect, you're going to pay what's equivalent to the normal fee for water, what's equivalent to the normal fee in wastewater, and the density impact fee. And that's the way it's also laid out within the uh, cap fee study that you guys received earlier. So what does that look like kind of on a graph? Um, for w the fee itself, for the wastewater density impact fee, we actually utilized Encina phase four and phase five expansion. Phase four was primary liquids, phase five was primary solids. So they, they give us good base. Now, uh, those are the best numbers we had. And to be honest, those numbers are on large expansion. So there's a, a lot of, uh, um, what is it, economies of scale there. Smaller expansions, we expect to be actually much more expensive. But these are numbers that were given to us by Encina. So looking at that, you can see the, the cost of those expansions to the district. You kind of look down, and the solids had a 27.50, liquids 38.13 in disposal, totaling $8,500 and change. So, but the fee isn't $8,500, even though that's what the cost of expansion is because there's some duplication when we collect, and I'll talk about that duplication and how we took care of that. Um, so added density has an effect on the district's capacity for water and wastewater, as I stated before. So what the study recommended was the density impact P uh, for water is the normal water charge, and that makes perfect sense. You know, it's based on a gallon, based on use. You build extra EDUs, it builds extra storage requirement, you know, pretty much. Wastewater has three components that we looked at, conveyance, land outfall, and treatment. And what the study said about conveyance is uh, that it's equivalent to our normal fee. So just collect the normal fee. And that also makes sense, too. The way we do it uh, with the size of the <coughs> pipeline is also based on use. And it's a pro rata per gallon or per, you know, into a diameter size. And the land outfall was another one. The study basically said, hey, this is really close. The land outfall number was within uh, you know, $20 of our existing capacity fee number. So we said just collect the normal land outfall fee within our normal capacity fee, and we're, we're whole. And then we, then we came to treatment, and we showed, hey, the treatment cost is $8,500.
However, the district already has a treatment component, not new treatment, but debt service. And those people that are increasing density have nothing to do with that debt service, so that should not be co collected. So it was actually credited back. So as you can see from the next line down here, so the recommended density impact fee for treatment was at $8,500 minus the debt service of the normal capacity fee, which is $4,000. So it ended up being like $4,400. Um, the recommended density impact fee for conveyance was a normal cap fee again, and the recommended density impact fee for the alcohol was just a normal. So for we collected, really, we don't call it a density impact fee, but every component is evaluated, was evaluated in the study to see how it affected the district, and that's the way it is also evaluated in the water and wastewater studies that are provided to the, the developers. So the impact fee, impact fee approach, the district has and again, this number is based on the 2008 master plan, so it's a little different now. Uh, over 18,000 wastewater EDUs uh, remaining till build out. So the maximum density increase that we knew at the time, uh, you know, you, you talk about University District, uh, the Creek area, Miriam Mountains was in there, it was about 6,000 additional EDUs, so about one in three. So uh, the majority of developments will not be affected by the density impact fee. Uh, the district was working with the BI at the time. I forgot the gentleman's name, Jeff. Um, I can't remember his last name. At the workshops, and the, he actually helped us guide towards this density impact the approach because his statement was, "It's not fair for a majority of developers to offset a specific impact of a minority of developers, and they would fight us if we were to roll this in and have one fee approach." So the BIA actually at the time helped us kind of go down this path towards density impact fee. Uh, the district only collects for an increase in density portion again. So we're not looking at the whole development, just that incremental difference. And all fees are collected are held for future treatment expansion. So it's separated out. So we can't use it for the Linda Vista sewer, or we can't use it for anything else. It's used for expansion pur purposes at Encina only. Um, and the district takes on the risk of those regional infrastructures. We're talking <coughs> land outfall and treatment expansion, which are things that, uh, you know, talking with the board, talking with staff here, was big projects that would kill most developments. Uh, and the fees were due at whatever resolution time, and I don't remember what they were back in 08. Uh, so with that, it's a very shortened presentation, but if you have any questions, I'd be happy to try to answer. Any questions? Yes. Uh, with regard to the uh, demand factors of the duty factors of 500, and 500 gallons per day per EDU and 250 on sewer, for, that's for conventional uh, single family residences. Are they, um, has that been evaluated for appropriateness? In other words, are, do we still think that's valid? Yeah, based on the 2008 mass plan, we actually had the five years of meter records. And again, as I was stating, majority of our meters uh, are single family have residents or you know, base meters. Uh, and the numbers are right there. They're right around 500 and 250. Uh, during this next cycle, we'll have another five years of data. And if they move, they'll move appropriately. But the EDU factor itself is, is not relevant to the cost, really, of the developer, because again, when a developer builds a high density unit, they're not charged a full EDU per unit that they build. But it, it does drive uh, facility requirements. Yeah, but if you lower the, the dollar, the gallons per EDU, then you'd have a larger EDU number, and so we'd be charging a single family home 1.3 EDUs, for example, and something that we want to, that would just add confusion, at least from a standpoint, that may add confusion. So in the next master plan, or the current master plan update, the appropriateness of those factors is being evaluated? Yes. Yes, uh, James, uh, with regard to the outfall, will the movement towards uh, IDP in direct potable or direct potable, will that have any effect on the requirement for the necessity of putting in an outfall? It, it may. Uh, the the timing is, is difficult, obviously, because as, as you're aware, probably more so than I am, it'd probably be a 15-year for 
direct potable reuse, it probably would be a 15 to 20 year timeline. And the timing of the outfall may come up before that. Um, however, if there was indirect or direct portable reuse opportunities, that may have an effect on the outfall. Mm -hmm. I'm positive. Go ahead. And just one last question for me. Just so that I'm clear, the treatment we're talking about is the expansion at Encina. We're calling it treatment, but it would be an expansion requirement or a purchase from some of the other members at Encina. Yes. And if I might on that, um, the to Director Eltharp's uh, statement, that's part of why the board does have us look at the master plan every five years. When we went through the last master plan, you recall we had actually just come out of the prior drought. And what we saw on that one was we saw the dip, demands went way off, but then they actually came back. Right. So what we're seeing in this one, and Director Evans will be familiar with this when she hears the full presentation at the Water Authority, um, the, the reduction in demands and sewer generation and water demand this time was a combination of both drought as well as economy. So we actually had an economy bust at the same time as drought concurrent with it. So that's where we saw a big difference in our demands, but we've seen it come back. And it wasn't necessarily because of reduction, it was because of empty homes, empty businesses, things like that. That's why our flow dropped off. So part of the analysis, they call it, is it bounce back? The rubber is there? <laughs> the bounce back, there's all kinds of theory, the reasons they use it, elasticity, uh, and how demands come back depending on people's uh, memory. So that's part of what we're looking at in this master plan is not only just the drought and the demands coming back, but we're evaluating that, the same criteria the Water Authority is using to see how much of it was financial related so that we don't overemphasize conservation when it wasn't a conservation driven topic. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you, James, that was a good presentation. Can you elaborate a little further, uh, as it, specifically as it pertains to the uh, sewer densification fees uh, some of the assumptions that um, that were taken as you were developing this this roughly four thousand dollars per extra unit cost, and when I say assumptions, I would imagine that there's um, you're basing that off of the cost of our share to expand in Cena possibly in 2030. Um, is that one of the things that you're taking into consideration? Can you kind of just give us a little bit better? idea of what the assumptions were when you were putting that, you know, coming up with that number? Yeah, I can tell you what the uh, uh, cap fee study used. It actually used the, instead of a, a, a roundabout number, it used the actual expansion numbers, the, the actual audited expansion numbers at Encina for phase four. And the latest numbers they had, which were verified later with an audit for phase five expansion. So they actually used the audited numbers. So we knew how much it cost at Encina and the amount of expansion that you use to get a basic a dollar per gallon type of number. They broke it down into a dollar per gallon number and then it was rolled up into an EDU number which is just times 250 basically. So that's how the majority, or that's how all the fee was used. The, uh, the actual fee that Valacitos had for its debt service, that was a known number because that was debt that was already incurred. Yeah, I understand so, that. So we use actual numbers on both sides of the house on that. Yep. And you had mentioned during your presentation that those particular fees um, are separated out and uh, are they within our reserves in a little side section of subsection of the reserves or where are they separated out and how much money do we currently have in that separated out area? Over the, oh, since we've implemented this plan. I don't know if we've collected any wastewater. We, but yeah, right now, uh, at, as your correct director, uh, Stella, when we did speak about this, where I said it's part of the capital fees, because we either have replacement or reserve funds. Uh, the capital funds, it's all in one, but it's tracked under fund 225, which is a separate fund. And since the board's adopted this policy, there's only been $110,000 collected <coughs> towards the impacts. Uh, right now, we do have uh, one project under construction, that's the Mulberry Residential Project, they will owe some. Uh, and then we have five other projects that are in various planning stages that will um, owe additional funds too. But right now we've only collected about $110,000. The other big project was the, yeah, what's it called, Universe, Twin Oaks, around the university. Uh, that project was not, did pay. Uh, they paid $130,000, but as part of the uh, settlement that the board entered into, we refunded that. So we do track it as a separate fund and a separate account. Thank you. 
Director Martin. Thank you, Jim. Great report. I've struggled with it for two years. I'm not the brightest light bulb. Uh, a couple of things is the first thing is uh, the concepts and methodology that you used. Uh, are they generally accepted in the industry? Only because I've spent two years querying a lot of people, which I have a tendency to do, on what they do, and they don't do this. So we're different. We don't have to follow the pack. I, I get that. But the concepts and methodology, where do they come from? From what model? From what area? From who uses it? Or was it completely between you and uh, the finance people that came up with it? Uh, are you referring to like, the growth methodology? For, for the concepts fee? and methodology for the fee. Yeah. So the growth methodology is, is a very common method. And, and actually, uh, uh, Tom may know more about it than I would as far as from the accounting side. But, but I know that the, most of the growth agencies use a growth method, while built-out agency uses a different method. So a lot of the agencies, when we were in discussion, that were used as examples, uh, like Irvine Ranch, for example, they're more of a built-out agency. Uh, and even like City of Vista is more of a built-out agency. Vista uses incremental, incremental approach is the other one, and then growth, and then Water Authority uses a hybrid, but uh, growth is appropriate for, for us because we're still a growth agency. And a, a city that, that you're very familiar with, Chula Vista, mm -hmm. uh, they must have the same, they're also a growth agency, not the city, but the uh, water provider and the sewer provider. Uh, are they doing the same thing as we are with capacity fee? Uh, when I was down there uh, at Otai Water District, they used growth methodology. I don't know what they used. We did contact the city of Chula Vista back then. Uh, they had the same concerns, but their approach from talking to staff at that point was we'll deal with it when it happens. The last workshop was uh, April 18th of uh, 2012. That was the last workshop. When was this actually adopted? What was the timeline by the board? Uh, August and November 2011. That's 2011. You adopted the policy April on October 2013. And then it took effect a certain amount of 60 days after that. Okay, and in 2012, you were saying, and I believe you're right, mostly because of San Alejo, that we were looking at single family homes. Mm -hmm. Since that time, we've actually changed quite dramatically into apartments, condos, and townhouses. It's evident by looking at the projects, the majority of projects that are out there and have been since that time. So, what you're saying is that that's not taken into account for. Or is it taken into account for? Yeah, yes, it is actually. That's what um, if on one of my slides, if I get to it really quick. Uh, I was talking about the high density mixed use right there. Mm -hmm. So that is taken account. You got to remember that we don't charge as a district the way we apply the fees. If you come in one unit or let's say ten units of high density or mixed use, you're not charged ten EDUs. So you only charge about 80% of that number. So basically, what we found out, because after 2002, we did have higher density uh, units that we could actually get real meter records from. And we actually had data that showed that, that it bottoms out about 200 gallons per day for water and about 180 gallons per day for sewer. And that's so far what we're showing. The new records aren't showing much different either that we're currently working on. So now we have a lot more to query, and that's kind of where the numbers kind of bottom out. So for our high density uses, and we adopted in the 2008 master plan two more land uses that were much more high density, mm -hmm. and they basically follow that 200 gallon per day for water and 180 gallon per day for sewer. So it, and it does make a large difference, because when we were first going through this practice with developers, we were still under the 2002 master plan, and the fees were up here, based on the way we calculated As soon as we adopted the mass plan, it gave them a 20, 25% discount on the fees, but that's because the uses were corrected based on conservation and smart growth. And another overall question, uh, it's the right place to bring it up because I know our outstanding debt that we have, and I'm assuming the majority of that's metal arc, would that be correct? It's yeah. metal arc and the scene of phase five for treatment. For, for sewer and then the tanks uh, from the water side, the uh, uh, reservoirs. Okay, but metal work. Well, let me ask a question about metal work. If 
if a catastrophe for a catastrophe were to happen, and we were unable to put any of our waste to Meadow Lark and it all went to Encina, tell me the ramifications. Um, yeah, I might, if you don't mind, Director Martin, he's not familiar with the RBA. Uh, the revised basic agreement at Encina allows that if an agency needs to convey more wastewater to that facility under an emergency, plant shuts down, whatever the case may be, if there's a reason for it, there's a certain time frame they're allowed to do it with no impact. You just pay your additional cost for more flow into the plant. If we were to, it's called infringing upon capacity. If we were to infringe upon capacity out of an emergency situation, let's just say we were actually flowing more there than we had capacity for, <clears throat> You're allowed to do it for a certain time frame, but after a certain amount of days, you have to start basically renting that capacity, and then you pay your fair share of whoever's capacity you're taking. Uh, if you go within a certain time frame, they're going to give you notice that you are now in violation of the RBA, and you have to then show that you're taking steps to build more treatment capacity, you have the funding in place, and you're ready to move forward. Okay. And currently, are we using the current capacity to its fullest? We have 7. It used to be 7.54 MGD. Uh, I don't know what it's, I don't know what the final number was from the revision, but I think we're really close. Uh, we have a total treatment capacity of 12.54 million gallons between Metal Arc and Encino. We're flowing somewhere six and a half, almost seven, almost seven MGD right now. So we're only sending about three to Encino. So we have extra capacity. We, we know that. We've never said we didn't. Uh, and we've said all the way along, it can be used. That's what it's there for. Um, so we do have extra treatment capacity. So we're probably flowing anywhere from 1.8 to 3 million gallons a day at Encina, give or take. And we own 7.5. Oh, okay. I guess my, my uh, overlying question is, uh, right now, do we have enough capacity to handle the water flow that we send to Meadowlark? Mm -hmm. To handle it at Encina? Yes, Meadowlark. We, we can send water. everything we have right now to Encina if we need to. Okay. So Meadowlark is a feel-good project and doing the right thing. And it's a reclamation project, and it also. But you got to remember, Meadowlark serves the southern basin. So whether or not we pump wastewater to Meadowlark from Summerlands Boulevard, we have to allow. I think it's three or three and a quarter million gallons per day comes from that southern basin. So we're either going to treat it there, or we're going to shut the treatment plant down, right. build a really big pump station, and then go buy another three million gallons per day of treatment capacity in Cena. We have to buy it somewhere. But we can't physically get it there we, right now. Yeah, and we can't physically get it to him seeing if we had to through that through that area. So our outstanding debt service, uh, uh, it's on two things. It's on Meadowlark and? Uh, Meadowlark and the Twin Oaks uh, Reservoirs, the big one, the 40 million and the 33 million. Can they be separated, those numbers? They are. They are. How much is Meadowlark? Meadowlark's about, well, Meadowlark uh, is about 22 million, and the, uh, that's the one, that's the bond issuance, and then there's another $8 million loan. About 30 million as of 2002. Yeah. And what's the debt service on that? That's, a, oh, the debt service a year? Yeah. Uh, combined, it's 4.5 million, so you'd carve out about uh, two, uh, a little less than half, I think, is sewer total. So it's for that's about pushing five million now with the new debt. So I think it's over five million. So probably two and a half million, roughly a year, is debt service. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. You know, I might correct myself, Director Martin. I said it was 2013. That's when we modified the water one. The board adopted all the fees April 18th, 2012. And as Mr. Simmons indicated, the board did uh, delay the implementation of the fee until November, well beyond the normal okay. period. I got my dates where it's 2012 when the board adopted the fees. Yeah, I think we remember just prior to uh, the board changing. Correct. Yeah, so I, I, just, I had 2013, that was a different one you adopted. Do you have any other questions? <coughs> James, are, yes, are there, thank you. Are there any other agencies in the county or the region that, that have a uh, sewer justification fee above and beyond the regular capacity fee for additional? Density? Not that I know for sewer. They have other fees for like water availability and other water fees above and beyond their normal fees. But, but uh, as far as I know, we, we have sewer. Uh, see if you can answer this for me because I'm, I'm trying to follow this conversation as we go. It sounds like we have plenty of capacity, right? And, and I'm talking about wastewater mm -hmm. specifically. Um, we have almost twice as much capacity now than we're currently using, it sounds like. The, the developers, when they build, the developer comes before the city and, and 
they asked for an extra five homes. They're gonna build. They, were, they wanted to build 100. They were approved for it, but then they, they're asking for a change. Now they want to build 105 homes. Th those five additional homes are still paying the initial capacity fee. Mm -hmm. So they're in there. They're, they're getting. They're, they're capturing the debt service, correct? No, remember the debt service is credited back on the fee because the fee itself, without the debt service being credited back, would be eight thousand five hundred. So they're they're not okay. paying any additional. But, but on those service. on those so on those final five homes, those additional five homes, they're paying the the eight thousand dollars plus an additional four thousand dollars, right? Or they're just paying four thousand dollars. They're paying the eight thousand dollars for the normal mm -hmm. wastewater the normal, fee, the normal but fee. the impact fee study shows that the, those additional five homes has an impact on that's eight thousand dollars. So in other words, another way to put it is those additional five homes should actually be paying sixteen thousand dollars, but they're actually only paying twelve thousand because we'd be double dipping on the uh, on the debt service. That's and that's the way the that's the way the study lays it out. And when they when the developer comes in for a wastewater water wastewater study, that's the way it's laid out. James, go back to that slide that show how all the fees were mitigated by the additional payment of the fees. Um, this one. Uh, yes. Okay. So basically, what the study showed is is their additional five units. They affect us in water, which makes sense. There's five more houses taking water, right? So we have to build a little bit more storage, and the storage is based on per gallon. Okay, the, there's conveyance, there's treatment, there's uh, land outfall. So it's all affected for every single, in other words, you build another home, people move in, they use water, they flush the toilet. So obviously it affects all aspects of our capacity. And what the study showed is, it's, a, it's equivalent or pretty darn close to equivalent to our normal fee. So just collect the normal fee from them. And then the wastewater treatment plant expansion fee, which is the density impact fee, that's actually like an $8,500 fee based on the study. However, those extra five homes shouldn't be penalized for the existing debt service on treatment because that's being made whole by the, home, by the original 100 homes. So that's credited back. So, you know, there's more than one way you can look at it and not to confuse the board. Really, those extra five homes should be paying 16,000 and then you credit them 4,000, which is the debt service, because that'd be double dipping, because the debt service would be in there twice. I, I, I understood the last part what you were saying, but you, you did ask just some of the confusion. So if, if we can cover the cost to treat the waste and pay, and, and pay the debt, with the initial eight thousand dollars for the first hundred homes per unit, why would it be different? Why couldn't we capture that with the the the, the, the additional five homes are still paying that eight thousand dollars? Then above and beyond that, they're going to be paying for potentially building uh, additional treatment capacity so, down the road, maybe in fifteen twenty years. So again, um, so those additional five homes, they affect the land outfall just like anybody else. And the study, the cap fee study, showed that. They said, okay, we're, we need to calc how they affect us on water and how they affect us on treatment and conveyance and parallel outfall. And what it showed is those additional five homes, you need to make the conveyance a little bit bigger for them. I mean, five homes is a very small example, but, but, and, but, but from a fundamental standpoint, they're flushing toilets. So they're not coming in and not using water or not utilizing the sewer system. They have full capacity connections and full capacity meters. So they're affecting storage, they're affecting conveyance, they're affecting treatment. The difference is there is no treatment component in our current fee. So there's only debt. So, but they're not affecting our debt. We shouldn't be double collecting on the debt as you pointed out. So that's credited back. So in, in reality, Another way you can look at it is those five homes should be paying sixteen thousand dollars for sewer, and they're paying twelve. That's you know, or they should be paying their normal cap fee of eight thousand and a four thousand dollar density impact fee. It's however way you want to look at it, it comes out to the same number, and uh, it's based based on the report. What Atkins is, they looked at each individual component, so it wasn't ignored that we're collecting five more units at capacity fee. That was taken into account within the cap fee site to make sure that there was no double dipping because we want to stay true to the AB 1600 requirements and have a full nexus. And, and the debt service is relatively fixed. I know there's interest and whatnot, but it's, so 
Is there, did you take into account your assumptions that if you did have an additional five homes that you'd be paying off your debt service sooner? Well, you're not because those, those additional five homes, we're collecting $4,000 for EDU and we're taking that debt service amount, that 4,000 and change, and we have to hold that because the expansion cost is shown in the table is actually 8,000. So we're under collected. So that is not being applied to paying off the debt service. It's actually being carved out on purpose because if we only save that $4,000 per EDU, we'd be almost 50% short on the expansion costs. What? I, I apologize for not monopolizing this conversation, but why why are the second why are the additional five homes that that initial eight thousand dollars that they're paying per unit? Why isn't it not, not apples to apples going to the same thing that that the first original hundred homes were going that that eight thousand dollars per unit was going to? If you're paying off debt service with the original hundred homes, and you're still charging the the, the latter five homes the same eight thousand dollars. Then, then on top of that, an initial four thousand dollars. What? There's, there's got to be some sort of debt service built into that initial eight thousand dollars that you're charging for the, the whole project. You're actually minusing out the debt service. So if you look at it, the the um, stop, you need to. One of the things that helps me out is I don't think about the density impact fee as a four thousand dollar fee. I think of it as an eight thousand five hundred dollar fee because that's what it is. So the table that I showed before, which showed all the treatment examples, showed that it's, it's going to cost $8,500 for EDU to build treatment, okay? not 4000 But you're, again, right. We're charging those extra five homes the, another $8,000 for regular capacity fees, but we carved out the 4000 So we're really not collecting that 4000 The other components of it, the other 4000 that's the missing components, well, that's our land outfall and our conveyance. And Yes, we are making the San Marcos Interceptor larger for them. Yes, we will have to make the parallel land outfall larger for them. So those are valid numbers that are in the study that says we should be collecting it. You know, another way to look at it is we collect $8,500 for density impact fee and only charge them 4000 and change for capacity fees. You know, there's more than one way to look at it. But at the end of the day, those five extra homes have a $16,000 fee and there's four thousand dollars in potential double dipping, so we have to carve that out. Okay, I think we're going in circles. But I mean, one more one more question before, um, because you you said something like the five five homes was not really a was kind of a small number, but it sounds like if my, if my math is right, we've only had twenty five or twenty six homes since two thousand eleven that were added because divide four thousand into the hundred ten. Is, is my math correct there? Over four years. Had yeah, this, this does not, as James indicated earlier, the majority of development coming into this district is not impacted by this fee. Uh, but, you know, let's, let's put one on the table. Let's look at Merriam Mountain. Okay, our master plan, let's say it allows for 400 units and they come in with X thousand. There's the extreme example, but you've got to remember when you go back in time, this board had numerous, uh, you've got the EIR at home for the master plan that we gave when you came on the board. Look in the section that identifies future development coming. We can't include them in the master plan, but we have to acknowledge them in the EIR. So what we do is, I mean, we were looking at six to 10,000 extra units coming in over whatever time period it may have been, Director Snell. The economy went down the tubes, things have slowed down. We're starting to see things come back, but a lot of the development coming in here is not gonna be subject to this fee. Uh, and as Director Eltharp said, we'll look at the fees, we'll look at the demands. As we're going through the master plan, we hope to have that before you by the end of the year. Uh, I, I think is our, our goal and once we have that we're going to know okay the, the premise that we had eight years ago five years ago three years ago has that premise changed does that policy still need to be in effect or do we find out that hey because of all these increases in land use we need to now include a treatment component in our capacity fee and if that's the case if it matches the other same four things that we already have, that when they do build the extra one, because there is in fact a treatment component, that might be the way they mitigate their impact. But right now, because there is no treatment component of the fee, when you pay the extra one, you're not mitigating impact. And again, as I indicated earlier, when we have to comment on an EIR, we have to provide a method where that development is mitigating its impact, not transferring that debt to somebody else, nor transferring that rate, that debt to future ratepayers. That's that was the whole purpose of the whole thing. And that, again, that's why you do a master plan every five years. Things change. I'm Director Hernandez. Hi. 
You okay. lost your thigh? It'll come back. <laughs> okay. Well, let's ask our There's speaker. another question, Madam President. Oh, I'm so sorry, Director Martin. Prior to this being instituted in 2012, and, and Katie barred the doors, uh, I, I appreciate the board did everything they could to stop what was happening in the 2000 era, uh, but it happened. How was it all paid for? Prior to doing this five-year look back in this charge, how, how did it get paid for then? Well, we had when a, we developed San Leo Hills, which is the big yeah. dog, uh, um, how did that happen? Well, yeah. in the 2002 master plan, we had enough treatment capacity with our expansion at Meadowlark and, where we, and with the phase five expansion at Encina. What happened after that, back in, in the 2000s, that things were developing, is we started working on the 2008 master plan. And within that, when we started getting the land use data in, we realized that we're whole to 2030. And so you, we've talked here about how we have extra capacity or not, or not. It's extra capacity today, but prudent planning puts us out to 2030 based on the master plan. And at 2030, we're whole uh, based on existing land use, existing sand dike projections on the previous master plan. Um, with that, there is no treatment at all. So as we're moving forward, we realize that some of these new developments were coming in were greatly increasing. We were talking with Marion Mountains was well, about the first one. And it became a large issue because they went from uh, three to 400 units to 27, 2800 units. And how are we gonna handle that treatment? And we started having conversations about how to handle that additional treatment because all of a sudden now we won't be whole. And they'd be coming in if they were approved prior to that 2030 horizon, according to their timeline that they gave us uh, through their development studies. Uh, that means existing land uses, existing landowners, existing developers would be developing within the realm of what they're supposed to, and they may be subject to an increased treatment fee, and would that be fair? And that was a discussion we had with the board, and that's what kind of prompted it all, but it's really the land use that came out as we move forward with the new master plan and realizing that we're good until about 2030. However, with the increase, we're no longer there. So the previous master plans, the previous plannings did a good job uh, with the expansions and the, uh, the purchases at Encina to make us whole through the planning horizon is what came out of it. And then a follow up, and I guess this is probably great for Dennis. So in 2008, the red flags went up. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, right around there. It was actually prior to that. We were looking at it prior to that, and the board had us go through this uh, process the very first time. I can't remember when it was exactly, but we went through this process initially. Uh, there were some, you know, I would say some flaws in the, in the logic and the theory and how we went about the development and the calculation of the fee. Uh, the board rescinded them. They said, come back and bring it back with the new master plan when you've got more current data. The other one was based on an older master plan. Uh, again, as James said in here, we look at five-year increments now in capital, where before it used to be, we just looked at 2030, and we assumed we spent the money across the whole time. That's why the funding is different. We're getting just a little more sophisticated to track it when we need it to spend it. We don't want to build ahead of time. Uh, that was an example. I think you've all heard it in Encina. Uh, we project, I think the first time I sent a letter into Encina was in 1986 or 81, and we project in five-year increments how much flow we're going to need. So when Encina's doing their planning, we don't want to build 10 million gallons today of treatment 15 years before we need it. By the time we get around to using it, we'll be paying to replace it. So that's why the old horizon was we were good, we projected when we had needed, but we started seeing all these, I want to say there were six or seven developments that we identified separately in our EIR that were above and beyond the approved land use. That's when the board said, okay, we're not getting the occasional guy who puts 10 units on instead of eight. We're getting the Miriam Mountains going from 300 to 2,800. We're, we're, that's the kind of density increases we're getting. Sometimes if it's two to, two to four per acre, they might get two. The other guy might get six. In, in the, it washes out in the averaging. That's how the master plan looks at it. But before the 2008, we saw so many significant land use densities. That's what the board said. Come back and modify it. So for 2008, 9, 10, 11, Mm -hmm. They weren't paying their fair share. We weren't collecting enough for our kid. So now we're making up for that. No, you got you got to look at the AB sixteen hundred. When you go through and you collect your fees, and the law is very clear on this, is you take a snapshot in time, you make your projections, you set your fees. 
Uh, if you want to look at that, I mean, I can tell you when I first came to work here, capacity fees were $100. <laughs> they should have been back then probably a couple thousand, but that's based on the information they had at the time. They went from 100 to 500, they went from 500 to 1900. So you can see significant jumps every time we did the capacity fees. It doesn't mean we did it wrong the prior time. It just means you've got new information, you've got new costs, you've got new facilities. Mm -hmm. You have that responsibility to do it every five years. The board could look at it every three years if you wanted to. It'd be a waste of time. We'd never actually have a document done. We'd adopt it and be starting on the next one. But just because we didn't have the fee set at something back then doesn't mean the fee was incorrect. Costs were cheaper. And the other thing to Director Snella, while you look at the, the difference in costs, we're getting the same treatment as $8,500, but there's only debt service in there. You gotta remember, this was a conversation you first came on the board when we were talking about this. When we did the expansion of Encina, it was as a partnership with all six of us. So all six of us expanded Encina, all six of us bore some of the costs, and you did expand the plant, but you got the economy of scale. So that's how we got a better cost. The 8,000 that we're estimating it's gonna cost to do it, I bet it's more 12 to 15, to be perfectly honest. But we can't guess on what the cost might be. We can only go with firm numbers we have. Yes. I did. Uh, now that we're gathering up better data, when we do this again, will we look at getting better data from Sandag and the city? Uh, traditionally, Sandag is you know 10, 15 percent, 20 percent larger than is projected, and they project. But the reality is, particularly during this last four or five year period, that it, it could not be correct because they didn't have the crystal ball. When we do the next one, how can we more accurately depict what we believe that uh, capacity or the number of units are going to be? So the way it's utilized is Sandag puts out a series. And in, in, in the 2008 master plan, I believe the Sandag series 11. 12? No, 12 was uh, urban water management. 11. So uh, two, in Sandag series 11 was grow baby grow. I mean, there was no yeah. recession in sight. When Sandag came out with a series 12, which is what our urban water management plan was at, it had recessionary numbers in there. Sandag series 13, I believe it's called now, which is what we're using in the current master plan, is the first series since the 2010 census that Sandag has come out with. So it's the first one right after the new census. It should be the most accurate. As you get further away from the census, the numbers get potential for more inaccuracy. So, you know, if anything, recessionary forces are in there, bounce back or elasticity is also in there, and we're gonna see some differences. We're gonna see, I, I'm expecting growth to be further moderated and, and spread out uh, from our 08 master plan, and it goes out another five years to 2035. These are all factors, uh, you know, again, 2002 master plan only went out to 2020, because that's what Sandag gave us. As far as the city information, the city took a long time to give us their land use information. They wanted to make sure it was accurate. So we're hoping it's accurate, because whatever they give us, Sandy gives you the population growth, the city gives you, the cities and the counties give you where that population is gonna grow, how, commercial, multifamily, single residence, and then we apply our factors on it to, to understand how much water that's gonna accommodate and how much sewer it's gonna generate. So I would just like to clarify then that this really is a process, if I hear you right, of estimation. And we get sand eggs estimate as best they can mm -hmm. at where we're at. We get the cities and the counties, what they're going to tell us to the best they can of what the land use will be. And then we, based on as close to those facts, we need to decide how that impacts us, not just for the for those five years, but beyond. Yeah, it's projected on. The sand is giving you every five year increments moving forward. And what we do is we utilize actual water meter records, actual sewer meter records to, to generate how much water that land use is going to use or how much sewer it's going to generate. And then we put it down. So the sand egg tells you the population, and that's their estimate. The city gives you what they want as a land use. And then we put our actual factors on there, which are actual meter records. And then we project out forward. And based on that, we're, we make, we set up our policy, we set up our, our policy, and that policy is supposed to 
um, cover the five-year period till we redo it. And sometimes we're on the low end, as we were, and sometimes we might be on the high end. But the idea is we're trying to collect the fees for the potential need for capacity if we go over what we estimated. Yes, and kind of the numbers are higher. That's what we're. Kind of like we showed on the graph, so we're trying to keep large jumps from happening in the, in the community. I mean, it's not good for development, it's not good for us. So we don't want to... James, we also, which did we reduce last time? So we reduced the sewer fee. So even when we did it last time, we actually reduced the base sewer fee from the prior fee. Because again, looking at it, what we found was we were collecting more than we needed based upon projections. New projections, we actually reduced it. I think you got one gentleman in the audience out here who was asked that question, and I don't think anybody's ever heard of that fee actually being reduced by an agency. So we look at it both ways. We could easily go down. It goes down. Well, well, I'm trying to understand what would make it a fair, a, a fair cost, and I do understand. I believe what you were saying is that if if you build extra homes, although you may not at this moment in time require additional capacity based on how we've planned our infrastructure mm -hmm. we do know that those homes are going to impact down the road and we don't work on a first come first sub sort of basis correct so we kind of guarantee everybody in the estimated facts that we get we guarantee them they're going to get it that number will get in at that amount and if you go beyond it you need to be paying for the future. Uh, we have to set One up, way or another, either you we build it now or you set money aside. Is that what the density fee is about? Yes, in a nutshell, it's it's you're 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 made whole by the existing land uses, you're collecting everything to make yourself whole. The additional above and beyond, you never planned for it. You didn't expect them, you never planned for it. There's no accommodation. So what do they need to mitigate the difference? Even if they're coming in earlier, because the idea is you don't want to saddle that to a future developer, it'd be unreasonable. And as you build out, there's less and less developers to pay for those fees. Okay, and did you have a question? Do yes, I, I did, thank you. Uh, have you seen the occasion where uh, someone came in to build something and their land use wasn't up to full potential? Uh, they're under, under utilizing the land use? Is that the question? Yeah. Uh, yes. And we issue them a credit for how much? We only charge them for what they're building. But you don't give them a credit for what they're not building. The uh, the city's land use, they could always add more density in it if the city allows in the future. So they're not they're only being charged for what they're building. So and then with the master plan and the way the city marks it is, there can be infill during a period of time. So everything is basically assumed by the ultimate build out to be at full land use, and that's the way Sandag views it. What I'm saying is a parcel which the use is 100 units. Mm -hmm. A devo, developer comes in and builds 90 apartment units instead of 100. There's 10 units that you have said we're going to be using the capacity for, which will never be built. Where does that credit go? If I might, Director Martin, we don't go by total number of BDUs. Again, being having your experience at the city, you have land use types that allow 4 to 6, 6 to 8, 10 to 20. So what we have is by doing our meter reads and our sewer flow, we know that that type of use generates X gallons per day per acre. That's the way the whole master plan is an averaging. So if we know that 10 to 20 generates 1,000 gallons per day, we're making the assumption that, okay, somebody might build 10 and it's 1,000 gallons a day. Somebody might build 20 and it's 1,000 gallons a day. It's an averaging effect over. We don't get right down to counting actual numbers of how many houses get built. But I'll tell you, I, uh, I've been around here a long time. I can't tell you too many projects that ever walk in and substantially underdeveloped their lots. I don't think the economy allows you to go too low on the density without being able to maximize it. But that's the way we look at it. The master plan says we're ranged. That's the planning study that we take from, this, from the land use agency. If it's 10 to 20, 40, 60, 80 to 100. That's what we assume because we have gallons per day per acre. So if it's 10 to 20, mm -hmm. your assumption is 20 units or 10? It's the, thousand, it's the gallons per day per acre. We know on average, because when we get down to actually analyzing the land use in our master plan, we get down to what they call parcel level loading. We know that that type of land use that the city identifies 
this 100, 100 square blocks is 10 to 20, we're not, we don't care how many are built per lot in there because that's like counting how many square feet of concrete, how many pools, how many yards. We, we can't get into that kind of detail. So we know that that type of land use for 10 to 20 uses 1,000 gallons per day per acre. So that's what we apply as a factor into the master plan. The population projection that Sandag uses is the highest density that, the, that it can use. We have to mix two numbers when we do it. But no, we don't get into a commodity balancing. I'll say, okay, you built 10, but you only built eight, you get two back. No. Somebody else is gonna build 12, it's an average. Okay, any more questions? Then I'd like to open, uh, thank you, James. Thanks, James. You did an excellent job. Thank you, James. Thanks, James. And have a large question. Yes. Uh, no, <laughs> stand by, there's bound to be more. <laughs> Okay, um, so the first one I have here is, um, well, before I, I say this, I'd like to um, just express that we'd like to keep it to three minutes per person. Um, and someone, would that be you, Tom, or who would be keeping, Jeff, keeping track of the time? And um, the first one up is John Seymour. Can, can I ask you a question? Yes, I'm you sure. may. I'm sorry. We, we've spoke about this before, but we've never done it. So explain to me, is this the chairperson's prerogative to call it three minute timing? I don't believe we have any anything. I'm part about it because I wanted to put it on mm -hmm. and make it something, but is it the chairperson's prerogative to make the three minutes? Is that what's happening? Yeah. So that's what's happening. Yeah. Thank you. The bill is John. I think, um, more of an organized presentation and I will go after them I'm going to yield my time to them but I'm still going to be able to speak I hope yes okay Thank you. sorry madam chairman point of order yes if I may um, is that the chair's total responsibility can the board overrule that so many people came and had more than three minutes I was unaware they were going to get three minutes they must have been unaware as well because yes. we've never done that before it's the um, what it's the normal practice is the chair runs the meeting and the chair sets out the time limits, the reasonable time limits. That's a normal practice. But my question is, can that be overruled by a majority of the board if they don't like that practice that we've never seen before? Well, yes, I guess you could bring a motion and ask for additional time, but it's, it'd, it'd be a bit unusual. I'd like to make a motion that some of these people came probably prepared to speak more than three minutes, some maybe less than three minutes, but I think they came here tonight with giving a presentation, and therefore they should be allowed to speak. We're here for them. They're not here for us. Doesn't our agenda. Thank you, and um, we That's have my a, motion. We Doesn't have a motion. But clarification, open-ended, uh, you, didn't, you didn't state a time Director Martin? I don't, I don't have a time. We've never had one before, but I'd say 15 minutes. Whatever they want to say, I'd like them to be able to say it. They came here with that not knowing there was a three-minute time limit that was just imposed this evening. The motion's to up to 15 minutes. I'll second that. That sounds reasonable. Okay. We have a motion to allow 15 minutes per speaker. Um, it's been moved and seconded. Those in favor say aye. 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 Motion passes, and our first speaker is? Motion passes, but what vote was it unanimous? Unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Michael McSweeney with BIA, how are you? Happy New Year, Madam thank Chairman, you. members of the board. Uh, thank you for giving me additional time because I can barely tell you my name in three minutes. Um, I have a couple things I'd like to hand out if I could. Sure, sure are, I see no problem with that. These are copies of letters that Central District, they want to pass it down. And then, if you remember, April of last year, um, myself and um, Steve Nielsen from Dexter Wilson did a PowerPoint to the board. And I know that um, Director Sinella and Director Elitharp, how do you pronounce your last name? It's pretty cool. Okay. <laughs> Elitharp, um, we're not in attendance. I don't intend to go over the entire PowerPoint. Uh, in the interest of time. But um, what I wanted to say was, first of all, we appreciate the district working with us. 
Um, I think that in the future, if it's possible, we would have less maybe disagreement over methodologies or what it should be if we were included into the process earlier as opposed to the consultants come to a conclusion and then we, then we have to try and argue and pick it apart. Um, you had made uh, in one of your remarks to uh, James about an estimation. It's more of a guesstimation of what they have to do. And I think that your district is, is challenged by two competing interests. You know, they don't want to overbuild, they don't want to underbuild. So trying to find the right balance is, is somewhat difficult. And the, the terms capacity and usage, it, it, it gets pretty confusing pretty quickly. And so you have to use one to calculate the other. So you have to figure out based on usage what you've done in the past to try and extrapolate that forward. And that's difficult because the one thing that no amount of good math can do is figure out what's the market going to be like in three years and five years. So when you, you couple that with the district has a master plan, but the city also has like growth management plans, they also have a general plan, do those, are, are they necessarily lined up or in sync? It seems to us that oftentimes a district will have <coughs> their plans here and the general plan here, but they don't sync up. One is out of date. So you're working off of bad data. And when, you do, when things don't jive, then you know we're left to try and figure out, okay, is this fair? We, since we're building homes, trying to you know, predict into the future, we kind of, I think, have a little bit better grasp of what the reality is now looking forward than perhaps either the city or an agency such as yours. A couple things that were in the uh, presentation um, is reclamation and reuse. You're seeing a, a trend, and I was just notified by the consultant for the Encina Wastewater um, Power Plant last week. They're looking very seriously, and they'd like the BIA to participate in reuse, turning sewage into you know, potable water supply. Um, that's going to happen sooner rather than later. Um, your Poseidon desalinization plant can easily be turned to take the flows from Encina, run it through that plant, and make drinking water without some of the environmental challenges with, you know, taking the salt out of seawater. So that's something that's happening. The other thing that, that the study didn't look at is how things are changing. Um, you probably don't know this, but in the last 15 years, new homes are almost 70 percent more efficient than they were 15 years before. Whether it's water usage, electrical usage, uh, heating energy. So what's happening is we're using less water, therefore there's less stuff going down the drain. Um, the other thing is with the cost of water going up, you're gonna see less lush landscaping. I think you'll find in, in model homes going forward, you're gonna have less turf, you're gonna have more indigenous plants. And then last but not least, any of the men in the room, um, if you've been into a newer building, you're noticing that the urinals no longer have a handle and they don't even have an automatic, they're, they're no flow. So there's no water discharge with that. These are the types of things that a capacity study is not looking at, but they are happening in the marketplace. And so I'd like to, if you could just take your PowerPoint. And the first four or five slides are your capacity and what you've built as opposed to what your master plans are. And the dotted red line is the historical and then the projection based on the historical. The historical you see is the dotted line and then the red line. That basically is smoothing out kind of the trend line that you've had since the early 80s. And then the next five slides, six slides, are the different capacity studies and where you thought you would be. And if you notice the one thing by the time you get to page four of the top slide, is you've got six different lines there, all with different angles of growth. And they're all over the trend line of what you've had since the early 80s. Then you bring in your SANDAG guesstimates. And so then you find out that, you know, there, there's, there's a case to be made that you're not going to reach your capacity or need to expand until maybe 2050. And I know that, uh, you know, I think that, you know, you put two lawyers in a room, you can get two different sides of the same argument. You put two engineers on a problem, you probably could come up with two different answers. And this isn't to say that we vehemently disagree with the district, 
but I think that there are some times that you know good people can come to different conclusions based on how they're looking at a set of data. And I think that what we tried to do was point out that I think that um, some of the data sets that uh, Atkins was looking at, maybe they weren't looking at it the same way we were looking at it, and that's how we came to different conclusions. When you look at pages eight, nine, it, it shows you kind of how we feel that this densification fee isn't really fair. Um, I know that uh, when James was explaining it, it's, it's difficult even for me, and this is part of my job, is to follow where he's going with that. It's not a simple, you know, cut and dried black and white explanation. But if the end result is you're trying to figure out how many EDUs and there's land uses and you have EDUs attached to those land uses and you're assuming that that's a static number, the marketplace isn't static. And if you then go ahead to pages Seventeen and eighteen. These are two examples of actual properties in your district. Number one, the Chang property. It's a hundred-acre parcel. According to the zoning, it would yield one hundred thirty-four units. Your capacity study would look at this property and say, "Yep, we're going to set aside one hundred thirty-four EDUs for this one." Same thing with the growth property down below, sixty-eight acres, another one hundred thirty-four yield. And then on the following page, page 18, the Ray Gray University Heights property, 494 acres, zoned for one unit per acre. So these are, you know, estate size homes, yield of 498 units. But what it doesn't take into effect is the topography, or what will the city actually allow? So when you look at the Chang property, it has a lot of slopes to constrain development. You're gonna get 18 homes there. When you look at the growth property, all right, it's, it's zoned two units to an acre, yields 134, but the, you know, the site constraints, you're gonna be maybe getting four unit, 40 units out of that. And then finally, the one uh, Ray Gray's property, yielding 498 based on one unit an acre, you're actually gonna get 75, maybe 80 homes out of it. So our question is, as, as I think Dennis you know, kind of said, you know, it all equals out, you know, two over here, four over here, you know, you're kind of trading those. If you're calculating your master plan based on a static number, all these properties came up with 134, 134, 498, but the reality is you're gonna have about 200 units built. How do you then balance against this densification? Because I can follow your argument that if we've assigned EDUs to a property, and let's say Betty has a property that's 20 EDUs, and she wants to do a mixed use, and it's gonna be a little more dense, it's gonna be what's called smart growth. That's all what state law is pushing us to build. Well, she's gonna to have to pay extra for those 10, but Craig owns the 494 units, or 494 acres, and he's only gonna be able to build 80, but Betty's gonna pay through the nose, but the district isn't gonna to have to use up 498 units that they've set aside in their master plan for that property. They're only gonna use 80 and they're gonna charge him the, the standard rate. So I guess what, what we've been saying, and that's why we walked you through this, was nobody else is looking at this problem the way you all are looking at it. And we don't agree with the way you're looking at it. We think that it's not equitable. Um, I know that you know one of our members had, had uh, um, taking you to court or threatened a lawsuit and you made a settlement there. But I, you know, none of the other agencies are looking at this like this. And I think that moving forward, I think what, you, what we would like to see you do is suspend this. Um, I think that that's fair. I think that as you, you're probably a year or two from doing your next master plan, um, I would ask that when you do that, figure out a way to include us earlier in the process. We have a record of collaborating with uh, anyone that wants to work with us, whether it's the environmentalists or the stormwater policies, uh, other cities working on trying to figure out a way to build affordable housing. There's more than one way to skin a cat, and I think that we are your customers, we're your development partners. I think we should have a say in this. Ultimately, whatever the district staff brings to you is gonna be their best guesstimate. And I think it's a more accurate guesstimate going forward if you can include us in the equation early on so that 
not only the staff, but I can be sitting in the front row going like this, everything that they say, because I'm in agreement with it because we've worked on it together. So with, with that, uh, what I'd like to do is, I know there's a few other um, of our members here. I know that uh, in one of James's slides, I'll conclude with this, you know, it showed that they were guesstimating 6,000 units. Um, but when you look at the marketplace and what's reasonably able to get adopted, whether it's by the County Board of Supervisors or by the San Marcos City Council, um, those numbers are not gonna be anywhere near that. So I think that overall, I'd, I'd prefer to let some of those folks share with you their specific examples. But I'd, what I'd ask the, uh, the board to consider is give staff some direction to come back with you know, a more equitable a way to do this and I would recommend that you suspend <coughs> ordinance 177 until your next um, master plan is complete and let's figure out working together if this is something that really needs to happen did I get under 10 minutes yes you did well. okay any questions about 15 you're, you're about uh, 13 right now all right <laughs> are there any questions from board members I did I had a question for yes. council um, Dr. Sinell. Uh, Jeff is is suspending these these if the board so chose to go that route tonight is that an option does that would that still have to go through that nexus process you were talking about the last board meeting well I think you need to put it on a future agenda I don't think you should it's not on the agenda tonight no, it's that specific action so you'd have to come back to the next agenda and then we can look at you know as far as what the there's a uh, uh, Notice provision. I mean, I don't. Is it on the agenda? Yes, it's, it's under action. Capital fees. Capital fees. Discussion. All three are included. It's. But is it? Is there a? Is there? A, uh, it was presented for action for discussion, but it's under an action item. Yeah, but I, all I'm saying is that I think the appropriate way to do it, my recommendation, would be is to bring it back for consideration of suspending that ordinance at the future board meeting. When we did it before, that's how we did it. Thank you. Yeah. For the attorney. Um, I thought that we had made it you know, perfectly clear at the last meeting when we discussed this that we wanted an action item, something we could do something about, and that's what we were told we would get it. Is that not what we're getting? Well, I think what you want to do is notify the public yeah. under the Brown Act what the action is that you're potentially going to take. You, you know, you can go ahead and do it. You can do it. But I'm, I'm just saying, if, if, if you were asking what my recommendation is I'd simply put it on a future agenda for consideration so the public and everybody knows what exactly you're doing but it's it's in under action items I was gonna say and you have a you have broad discretion but if you were asking what my recommendation is I, I think you should put it on a future agenda okay but it was put on this agenda correctly that an action could be taken it was notifying the public we we're speaking about this we we're discussing it yeah it just says that you're, it just doesn't say what you know, what the action was, and I don't think it was discussed what the potential action was going to be at the last meeting. Yeah, all the board asked was if you could take action if it was on the agenda, and I said yes. Okay. Not knowing what Director Snell is questioning or yeah. rationale behind yes. requesting it to come forward, I'm not going to second guess it, so I'm not going to put a recommendation for that. But it is before the board. Uh, I think prudence would be you do give the public notice that you are going to consider rescinding, but, yeah. but you could take action tonight if you so choose. Good timing. <laughs> Good job. Perfect. The next would be Jason Simmons. Oh, yeah, John Seymour there. Oh, John Seymour, you Thank would like you. to come forward now. Thank you. Thank you. Um, John Seymour, I'm with uh, National Community Renaissance. It's a 22 year old nonprofit affordable housing developer, owner, operator, and manager. We build senior housing, family low income housing, veterans, special needs. I've been with the company for 18 years, and here in San Marcos, we have five apartment home communities. We have a couple more in the planning process right now, totaling 700 right now, maybe two or 300 additional in the near future. We also have, um, we also work with over 50 different municipalities, cities, agencies, authorities throughout Southern California, Inland Empire, Riverside, San Bernardino, LA County, Orange County as well, all the way south of uh, National City about 8,000 units. 
and we fully understand the payment of development impact fees and sewer and water fees. We've never come across a density fee like this before. Um, I've had my nose into this many times in the past. No cities that we've ever worked with has this type of fee. Um, to say the least, we are very concerned about the methodology of the calculation of the fee, the duty factors. When we're building our apartments now, they are so efficient in the water and sewer area. In fact, by the year 2020, the state is requiring us to go net zero. That's right around the corner. Our water and sewer usage is going to be net zero, close to it. I don't know how we're going to get there, but they're making us do it. We have no choice. You shall do it, and that's part of um, the governor's plan. Not to mention his climatic, his, his climate action plans, his reduction of greenhouse gases, trying to lo locate with higher density near TOD sites. So all that combined, and I've looked at your study, I am concerned very much about how that thing's calculated going into the future. Um, I think it's reasonable to suspend the fee right now. I think it's reasonable to come back and, and look closely to see how it's calculated, to let uh, Mike McSweeney take a look at it, be involved in the process of the calculation of it, rather than have the report come back and now he's in a response mode to have to go back. It's very difficult at that time. Um, you know, we're all about paying our fair share. That's what we want to do. But it is having an aggravated effect on our ability to provide affordable housing. Thank you very much. Thank Question. you, Mr. Seymour. Sorry. Yes, Sir, Mr. Yes. Martin. Uh, John? Yes. When, when you go through your scenario now of before you start going through everything you do to build an apartment, mm -hmm. do you look at water use? Is that something that you're mandated to do now? Absolutely. And what do you, is there numbers that you come up with for how much water each unit is going to use and how much sewer? Yep. Our older, our, yeah, our older apartments um, have an EDU methodology that we've used gallons per day. Our new apartments, the one we just grand opened on Autumn Terrace, Westlake, far, far below our older apartments. So when we're going back and demolishing those and rebuilding new and building new, the duty factors that were put up on the board, I think it was 250 <coughs> gallons per home or something like that. Our apartments are not even close to that because we have, we don't have turf anymore. It's it's all uh, well. You'd have to go for a tour of Westlake Village to see the beauty of it, and it's beautiful. But there's no little to no outside landscaping that needs water. The indoor use um, facilities, the toilets, the showers, um, are extremely low water use, um, and. Uh, the state treasurers, the tax credit advisory committee who gives us the tax credits, they're requiring that we're going to a net zero in the year two, uh, 2020. Do, do you have numbers now when you formulated Westlake? Yeah. And, and the sister to it right next to it is Ginger's project. And I have Correct. toured both those projects, unbeknownst to you. Uh, and they're just phenomenal. But are there numbers out there as yes. to what they should use? We could, you get you the, we could get you those numbers. We could get you uh, Ginger's, Autumn Terrace, or Parkview. Um, we could get you our Westlake Village. We could get you our, um, our Villa Serena. We're uh, doing a water study. In fact, we have to start a water study here pretty soon right. on that project. And that would be your guesstimation. That's right. Great. That we would submit to the district for examination. If you could submit that, I'd really appreciate it. I think we'd all appreciate getting that. You just got it. We sure will. Again, it's a guesstimation just like ours, but it's another guesstimation. We, just, we actually have their meter reads. So that's what we go by. I'm sorry? We actually go by the meter reads, not what they guess on. Okay. And for our new developments, we're submitting our, our studies. So that would be an interesting to know, to look at, say, Villa Serena, which was built in the early 70s or late 60s, and compare that against Westlake Village and Autumn Terrace, and what we're, what we're going to be doing in the next five years. You're going to see a fall. Um, and that's not, you can't calculate into that, your factor right now, because you don't know what we're planning to do. The numbers that have come down, uh, Mr. Lamb, I don't think that that's part of your, your calculation now in the duty factors. It will be. We Every five years we go through and we look at every one, and when the board will get this before them, what you'll see is a historical, the last four master plans, here's what it was, here's what it is, here's where it's going. We see that and we see the trend kick in every time. So we take that into consideration every time. If you go back to the old days, I think we showed we were going to need 26 million gallons a day of sewer treatment capacity based upon the way studies were done, based on the way the models were done. 
based upon internal toilets. Everything, it changes over time. That's why we do a master plan every five years. We recapture what the trend has been for the five years. We don't go off of one project's ability. We might have one project that, for whatever reason, they're using three gallons a day. That's not something you would use as a reasonable planning horizon. You look at all of the meters, you look at the averages of all of the meters, and you move forward. Five years, you look at the last five years. Five years after that, you look at the next five years. It's an ongoing process. And so right today, I'm telling you with that, that the fee is, that fee is overcharging us right now. I don't know by how much. I know it is. I, I know it is. I don't know how much, but it is. It maybe wasn't for Villa Serena, but for now it is on the new uh, stuff. Did you have a question for Well, now? no, I, it just, I, we did that, and we were at the 250, uh, and, it, and then now we're at 180 for mixed use. So yeah. we have come down as well. So now the question will be in the future, how much more that, if that needs to come down, Overall, right, and stuff that's in the, if, 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 if the, stuff the entitlement process right now, Mr. Hernandez, is below 180. And that's it, it, I know it is. Well, if what instead of you're guessing it, if we got those bills for that the water meter bills and sewer uh, uh, capacity, not capacity flow, then that would help us potentially in the future when we do a review. Yes. Okay. Okay, and the next speaker I have is Jason Simmons. <laughs> President Evans, director, staff, thank you. Appreciate your time. I know this is kind of a tough topic. Um, there's no easy answer here, but um, I, I think part of this is just collaborating and understanding what we're dealing with here. So I'm going to go through a couple of examples. I'm actually here representing a bunch of clients, but I've got Intracorp uh, actually here. Um, D.R. Horton could make it uh, today, but they, I do have a letter I'm going to submit on their behalf. And I'll be at the end for you guys. Um, won't take the time to read it into the record. But uh, I just, I guess, Did wanted you to say you have a letter to pass out, or yeah, no, it's I'll just uh, submit it. Yeah, submit it. Yeah, yeah. Um, so the, the way that I'd like to actually use Intercorp as a perfect example of how we're stuck in a bit of a cycle here, and, and as this translates, so. Their project, um, what is known as Davia Village, is being constructed next to Palomar Station. I think everybody's familiar with that project. And Director Ellitharp, if you're not, it's a uh, high, uh, high, high density um, next to transportation uh, right down the street. So you can probably walk there. Um, and their project originally was uh, industrial. Okay, so that was up until 2012 when it, the general plan was changed. So in 2008, when you did your master plan, it was listed as industrial. But now in 2012, it's in the new city general plan for 354 units. They actually increased the density on their approvals to 416. So they're a perfect example of everything that kind of can happen in a process. Um, when you update your master plan, Next, it'll go to the general plan, right, of the city. That's what it's considered. So that'll be up to the 354, but it still won't have for the additional capacity that, or the density that they added. So it's a good example, um, and I wanted to point out that when they, when you do update to that, they wouldn't be paying, and I'm, I'm looking to make sure that I'm correct here in this statement, they wouldn't be paying the density impact fee on the 354 that's in the general plan. Right when the new master plan updates, is that or am I misstating? We, that? we don't know yet. We have to. It has to be developed and studied. Yeah. Okay. My understanding of how that would eventually work, though, is that because this is how it worked from 2002 to 2008, was a lot of those that weren't in the general plan then got folded into the new general plan. And when you did your 2008 update, it considered those densities, so that adjusted, right? And then there's no density impact fees for those same units that do have it today. And that may sound confusing, but uh, maybe because I ran through it in my head 10 times, but yeah, please. Can, can, can I add a question of staff just yeah. to clarify? Yeah. I'm sorry. Yes. Yeah. Question yeah. of staff just to clarify. That snapshot of time when I was told, uh, there was a snapshot in time we took a year ago, a year and a half ago for the new master plan, mm -hmm. six months ago. How long ago? What date was that? <laughs> June we all talked about it here as a snapshot. This is the day. June 30th, 2014. 
and so the new city general plan is in there and whatever the SBA amendments as of June 30th, 2014, will be captured in the new mass plan. Okay, so were you approved prior to June 30th, 2014? Uh, yes. The project. Yeah. And that, bring, and that brings about the fundamental discussion of what the board had with us, right there. Is historically in the past when we would do that, we would roll projects into the new master plan. But you saw projects that were coming in with a little bit of density increase, a little bit, so it averaged out. So when the 2008 master plan was adopted, that's when the board said, is it fair? And these were a lot of discussions we had with the BIA and everybody in the room, is it fair? when a project comes in with a density, we're not talking 20 to 40, we're not talking 30 to 70, we're talking commercial 500 and something units. It's night and day. So the question that the board brought forth and what we tried to look at as staff and the policy that we brought back to the board and what the BIA was grappling with and the rep back then didn't agree with it was is it appropriate to spread that spread? We're gonna need more treatment. Let's, let's go into the presumption that we need more treatment because there's 500 extra units. Is it appropriate to take that treatment cost, roll it right into the cap fee, and everybody pays it? So the guy who builds within his <coughs> limits, he's paying for his capacity, but now he's got a little chunk on top of it because the Simmons project has 100, 100 times the capacity. That's the dilemma that was given to staff by the board to look at. How do you equitably spread that impact? You made a good point, Director Snell, that we've only collected from a couple projects. They didn't have any impact. Now, if we roll all of the stuff into the master plan like historically been done, and as Tom said, we have that decision hasn't been made yet because we haven't even gotten close to the master plan of bringing you the fees. Is it appropriate to take a project that has a significant density increase and say, ah, what the hell? Let's just roll it right into the averaging of everybody else's fees so the rest of the growth that is doing normal growth is now subsidizing that density. That's the dilemma that was thrown at us by the board. We did the best we could in bringing this policy back before the board. Obviously, there's still a lot of concerns. Yeah, there is no perfect way, I can tell you. But that's the issue that we brought before the board. Uh, a follow-up, as we heard in our last meeting or the meeting before that, we were talking about a user that was using hundreds, an industrial user that was using hundreds of thousands of gallons a day. So really, it would get down to, for instance, the project that they're looking at is where we used to have the uh, glass manufacturer? Sig Sigma Normalite. Sigma Normalite. Sigma Normalite. Mm -hmm. I don't know how much water they used, to be honest with you, but you put it under one category, now you're bringing in 400 units that might use less than that industrial category used, depending on what the industry was that was there. Per perfect, good point, very good point. A good example. That's and right the analysis point. actually did come out that yeah, way. Yeah, right on point, and, we, and we have that happen quite often. And again, I'm gonna go back to Marion Mountain. Marion Mountain was zoned as, um, Agriculture. Agricultural uses more water per acre than residential. So when we did all the studies for uh, Miriam Mountain, their impact on the water side was actually almost equal to or maybe plus or minus a few gallons, literally, of what it was for um, ag. So there was no harm, no foul. There was nothing to mitigate on the water side. Wastewater side, we had, I'm gonna grab a number, 300 homes allowed because obviously that's billy goat country. Uh, now there's 2,800 the impact is night and day. So it's water impact versus sewer impact are two totally different animals. They don't necessarily equate. They could actually use generate more um, water, use more water than sewer in the process they used to use because they actually used some of the water in their process who would have put less sewer out than water. Right, but they might have. Well, theoretically, they could use but less. But that's a total unknown. Absolutely. It's we don't know how much went the ways and how much did it. Right. That's why we do studies for every single project. Well, right. and I wanted to point out that the 6,000 EDUs that was associated with this kind of unknown boogeyman growth um, is not going to jump out of nowhere and scare everybody. It's planned well in the future, which is what those large specific plans did. They took a large area of land, the creek and university district area, and they planned for 20 years out. Um, but those don't happen overnight. And in fact, they're adjusting all the time. University district that was originally approved reduced their commercial by 300,000 square feet. Yeah. I don't know if that yeah. was considered in this process, but that's a huge number to reduce your commercial. And obviously, that's a lot of restaurants, which is a lot of sewer. So um, those considerations, I think, are hard to 
put your thumb on right away, but they need to be considered, and, and that's why I think we want more of a collaborative process with this next master plan so that we can actually all look at that and see how the creek is not gonna build out as planned. So that's a lot of unused capacity sitting there. Um, so a couple other quick points and I'll, I'll jump out. Um, last year in San Marcos, there was 100 building permits for units. That's 100, not, not 10,000, not 1,000, not even 200, that's only 100. So that's not even close to what was anticipated. So that happens. You have off years, I know we're in a down economy, but it is recovering, and yeah, but are we ever gonna really truly go over the 20% high estimate that we get from SANDAG? Definitely not. Um, so let's see, the last, last one I had was kind of on that same, and that's that, you know, that we have really, we don't have a capacity issue. I think everybody's acknowledged that. We have a density, I guess, estimation issue, okay? You gotta fit this much density into this much capacity, and it's gotta work with, with the extras and reserves and all that good stuff. There's this much capacity right now, and, and we know we have the capacity, and it's future planned, and we have this much density. When we add the density here, then I can understand the concern, and that's where this fee came from. But the reality is, it still fits back in the same amount of density most of the time, and traditionally, these master plans that get planned, you're not gonna go over the density. It just doesn't happen. And so we can look back historically and see that. And so I think that's kind of what we're saying today is let's be fair about the approach to charging this fee and let's go ahead and suspend it until we can fully analyze it. And if that's in a later meeting, that, that's fine. It is what it is, but point being, let's take some action now um, soon to go ahead and, and analyze this appropriately. And, uh, and I think that's what we're asking for. So any other questions any for me? Any questions for him? Thank you very much, Jason. Okay. I'm just gonna give my DR Horton letter over here. Uh, and I guess, actually, on that topic of the, the DR Horton, um, you know, they already paid their seed glass fee, and they are the, the Mission Grove project is the other fee that's upcoming here in the next few months. And if there is a suspension of the fee or whatever happens with it, um, you know, their request in this letter, and I'll, I'll hand it off, is that, that they're, they either get their money back if they pay it, or if they do a fee deferral, that they're not obligated to that fee, depending on what happens with the fee, since it is unknown today. I have a yep. yes. quick question, though, if the fees are brought up. Uh, Horton's paid their fees, um, except for the impact fee? Um, on the C glass project, they paid, yeah, all their fees, including the impact fee. Yep. And on their new project, how many units are they physically building? Um, the new, the new project or the old one? The new one, 126 units. Behind 711. I'm sorry. The one behind 711. The one behind one. You guys know what it was? Sea glass. It's like it wasn't that many. Yeah. That's that's a 126 unit project, and it's 125,000 dollars piece. But the older project was in San Alejo, and it, or um, not San Alejo, but uh, the Spyglass one. I, Anyone know? I don't know what that one was. I think okay. it was eighty-five thousand dollars piece. Yeah. That so the one they're building right now is one hundred and twenty-six units. Yes. And what was the land use on it? How many could they have fit in there? Uh, they and, and and to note, they came in lower than the density that was in the general plan. The well, problem is it was previously industrial. industrial. So it was previously industrial. Prior to June thirtieth of twenty fourteen. Uh, um, no, prior to the old master plan in 2008. There was a previous snapshot date. Right. This, that's the new snapshot date. There was an older date from the oh, 08. The old data was still industrial. Until industrial, right. They would have 125, 680, 664. $125,664. Oh, thank you. Okay. Well, well, yeah. not, uh, just, just, to, just, to just to clarify that the fees that was not just solely the, the, the density impact fees, that was the total of the fees that they paid? No, that's no, just the density impact fee. That's the density impact fee. Madam President, yes. before we have another speaker, could we make a break? Could we please, yes. I no, hold it. I'll take a break. <laughs> Hold it, buddy. Let's keep rolling. <laughs> so we'll, we'll announce, keep rolling, yeah. but we're going to take a break before we'll we roll. We'll have a recess for five here. Pardon? Yes, let's take a recess okay. for five. Okay. Thank you.